During the events of the Metal Gear series, there were a handful of attempts to clone or copy the greatest soldier ever known, Big Boss. Be it by creating genetic duplicates in the form of his sons, or gene therapy in the form of genome soldiers, or even his own self-made phantom. But there was one imitation that ignored Big Boss himself, and strived to create something that would go beyond his legend, only for it to end up joining his legacy. I'm of course talking about Frank Yeager, also known as Gray Fox. <laughs> Frank Yeager is one of the coolest characters in Metal Gear. He also holds the record of being the most reoccurring boss in the series. Along with this, he's the catalyst for one of the most important moments in all of Metal Gear as a whole, that being both inspiring Snake and cutting off Revolver Ocelot's arm. Though, before we get too into that, we should understand the meaning behind Frank's designs and names, and understand the history of this character. Though I feel I should clarify before I start that I will be using information from Metal Gear Solid Portable Ops when discussing Frank's early life. Even though that Portable Ops has ultimately never been addressed as canon. Shining light does nothing, huh? But I feel like it doesn't clash with confirmed canon and helps build upon Frank as a character. So with that being said, let's start with Frank's early life as a child soldier. Frank Yeager, before he was given the name Frank Yeager, worked as a child soldier for the Mozambique Liberation Front in Mozambique. And he was given the name Frank Yeager by his enemies due to him playing the role of an honest or frank-natured child before attacking his targets like a ruthless hunter. He was indeed a Frank hunter, and the hunter would be changed to Yeager as the boy spoke a little German. And and during the Mozambique War of Independence, Frank killed dozens upon dozens of Portuguese soldiers, making himself into an urban legend of sorts until he encountered the legendary soldier, Big Boss. Big Boss would defeat and rescue Frank from the battlefield, placing him into a rehabilitation facility trying to give a child soldier a better shot at life. Though while on the care of the facility, the CIA took interest in him due to his history of bloody warfare, and decided to adopt and then draft him into the Perfect Soldier program. And it was here that Frank would be subjected to one of the first of many grueling acts of torture that he'd be victim of through his bloody career. Though the Perfect Soldier program was probably one of the simpler ones, as they would dunk Frank into a sensory deprivation chamber when not out on missions. This would result in Frank suppressing his emotions and turning into an efficient assassin who could kill without remorse. Along with this, it helped increase his agility and senses to the point he was able to dodge or deflect oncoming bullets with a knife or blade. He gained all of that at the cost of his ability to retain memories, as he wasn't allowed out of the sensory chamber unless he was on a mission. And that type of stress on the body and mind over time overwhelms just about anyone, leaving Frank to be the only surviving member of the program. Hence why he was given the new name, Null, the Perfect Soldier. As the Null came from both him having nulled emotions, but also because the Perfect Soldier program was an utter failure and covered up, such his existence was covered up as well, so he was deemed a missing number or a null integer. And this whole backstory and some of his design are very similar to and were likely inspired by the 2004 Captain America comic book run, The Winter Soldier, which tells the tale of Bucky Burns, Captain America's old boy wonder and sidekick turned into a killing machine after being recovered by a team of Russian scientists and rebuilt and brainwashed into their own personal super soldier to counteract Captain America himself. Frank and Bucky are also very similar as they were both born assassins. Bucky, while teaming up with Captain America during World War II, would act out as a child soldier-esque assassin, doing jobs for the government that would be deemed too gruesome for Captain America to do himself. Both were also very skilled at their assassin work and had their memories wiped after every mission. They also have some similarities in their design, with Noel's right shoulder pad of his sneaking suit being red, very similar to the red star on the metal arm of the Winter Soldier. Though, after they met a man from their past, the guy that they were built to destroy, their lives changed for the better. We see this when Noel or Frank meets Big Boss again and recognizes him to a degree, but being unsure of why he remembers him. And during the events of Portable Ops, Noel is unable to kill Big Boss in their first fight, which ends in a stick and Noel, when placed back in the sensory deprivation chamber, is unable to forget Big Boss, and he's desperate to find out why, so he escapes from his chamber and slaughters all who stand in his way on his one mission to fight and figure out who Big Boss is and Noel would get exactly what he wanted. He encountered Big Boss again and was finally defeated. Afterwards, his memories would come surging back to him, remembering his name Frank Yeager. Big Boss then apologized to Frank for assuming that he would be safe in the rehabilitation center by himself. Frank Yeager forgives Big Boss for saving him, not only physically, but mentally as well. As before encountering Big Boss again, 
Frank's mind was truly null. He had a serious nihilistic outlook on life, wondering why people even chose to live their lives when they were just going to die one day anyways. And Ball showed him that the reason people live is to try to make a better world for others to live in as well. Afterwards, he would be hospitalized and his battle data would be stolen by Ocelot to be given to the Patriots for a future program. And over 10 years later, Frank Yeager would find himself returning to the battlefield as a soldier for hire, ending up as part of the Rhodesian Civil War. And during this time, Frank would put his skills as an assassin to work, targeting a couple for the war effort, though Frank didn't know it at the time that this couple had a young daughter, who in killing her parents doomed her to a life of being a war orphan. And he would only find out sometime later when he discovered her half-starved near death by the riverbed. And in taking one look at her, Frank recognized instantly who she was, and that he was responsible for putting her in that position. And the immense guilt flooded his body, so Frank took her in, gave her his rations, his name, and claimed to be her adopted brother. And so everything he did for her was in a vain attempt to repent for the sins of those he murdered that day. But those killings would forever haunt his life, when deep down, every time he looked at her, he was always nervous, fearing one day that she might grow to hate him if she ever found out who he really was. This woman would go on to be... Naomi Hunter. Though he was still a soldier and he can't escape his yearning for war and conflict, thus he would partake in more wars all the while taking care of Naomi. Until during his time fighting in the Mozambican Civil War, Frank was captured by the enemy and subjected to torture for hours. Over this time, his captors would cut off both of his ears and his nose, and things were seeming hopeless for the man. As he was too loyal to talk and right at the end of his rope, Big Boss appeared and rescued him again, bringing him to safety and reuniting him with his sister Naomi. Big Boss then went out of his way to treat the two to a home outside of war and conflict. He pulled some strings and brought them to America and got them American citizenship, likely to help get Frank cosmetic surgery as well, repairing the damage from his torture. This whole act was a power move from Big Boss in order to build up trust with a skilled soldier like Frank, and it worked, as Frank felt forever indebted to Big Boss for not only saving his life three times, but now he's given Naomi something that he never could, a peaceful life in America outside of the conflict that Frank constantly lived in. And after he recovers from his surgery, Frank decides to abandon Naomi in that life while he returned to Mozambique with Big Boss to both help pay off his debt to Big Boss and raise money through the conflict to help get Naomi into a good college. Frank was doing the only thing he was good at so that someone else could have a better life than he ever possibly could. And he would fight in conflicts until 1988 when Frank would finally decide that he was going to return to the West and take a well-deserved break from war. War, donning his new family name fully for the first time. Thus began the short and tragic existence of Frank Hunter. And it's during his time as Frank Hunter that he was able to attend the 1988 Winter Olympics in Canada, and it's here that he met the love of his life, Gustava Hefner, a professional figure skater, and the two wanted so badly to elope that Gustava risked her figure skating career and seeked asylum in the West. But the US ultimately denied her application, likely as a punishment towards Frank for working with Big Boss during his time as a war criminal and enemy of the state. And this choice by the United States government would not only ruin Gustava's life, but also light that flame of rebellion within Frank, causing him to distrust his government and being more willing to go against them if the time called for it. He would then go on to join Foxhound, who recently took up new management under their former founder, Big Boss. And Frank, being a talented soldier, would easily earn the highest honor in the company. He was awarded the title of Grey Fox, which is likely due to the fact that Grey Foxes are the most common fox breed in the United States, where Frank was awarded the title, along with his gray or silver-like hair. Then in in 1995, Grey Fox was assigned to Operation Intrude N3112, which is a mission that required Grey Fox to infiltrate the fortified state of Outer Heaven and gather data on their top secret nuclear weapons operation being run by an unknown leader. Though after successfully gathering the information, he was kidnapped. The last transmission he got out was the words, Metal Gear. Now this is just my speculation, but I feel like this whole scenario was created as sort of a distraction for Big Boss, which included Grey Fox getting captured. Fox must have known about the body double scheme in Cannon and decided to work with Big Boss in order to get back at the government who had ruined his and his lover's life. Feigning his capture, likely with the intentions of joining Big Boss and Venom, after the TX-55 prototype was finished. Though, to the shock of everyone involved with the situation, a new Foxhound recruit managed to topple the whole situation, save Grey Fox, and kill Big Boss himself. And over the course of the Outer Heaven incident, Snake and Grey Fox actually grew close to each other, becoming sort of friends, if not family in a way. They both were children of war, even if Snake didn't know the full story yet, and Fox became like a missing 
missing father figure in Snake's life. Snake himself even claiming that even though they knew each other for such a short period of time, he considers him to be one of his only true close personal friends. Though after the fall of Outer Heaven and the identity of Big Boss was discovered, Gray Fox disappeared completely. Then in 1999, he would assume the alias of Solid Snake's number one fan as he was going through the Zanzibar Island uprising. The reason Gray Fox took on this identity is he felt that Big Boss's plan was a bit too drastic and put the world in too much of a war state. He hated war and felt like it would endanger Naomi as well, so he decided he wanted fate to choose the winner. Though the two would meet in person again on the Bridge of Sorrow, as Big Boss likely ordered Gray Fox to prevent Snake from leaving with Madnar. Thus, once the Doctor crossed the bridge, Gray Fox fired a missile at it, destroying it, and tragically, killing his former lover in the process, though it is not clear if Gray Fox knew what he did. Gray Fox would then go on to taunt Solid Snake throughout the journey, while also taking on the identity of his number one fan, playing both a supporting role and an antagonist role for Solid Snake throughout the journey of the game, until they meet once again and begin their final duel. Fox piloting Metal Gear D and Snake armed with only his equipment and the knowledge of D's weakness. And the battle ends with Snake completely crippling the machine, but the explosion from D causes him to have to discard all of his items as they catch fire. Gray Fox then challenges Snake to one final battle to the death, fists only among a room covered in landmines, to ensure that there would be only one victor. Snake complied and the two dueled, Solid coming out the winner, and the two shared one final moment with each other. Neither hated each other for the path they chose. They were both professionals and still considered each other great friends who were just stuck on opposite sides of one conflict. Gray Fox then allowed his body to fall into the landmines that surround the room, leaving it crippled and broken beyond belief, hoping to find peace in the afterlife. But when it comes to Metal Gear, life is never that simple. Because you see, Gray Fox's body was discovered alongside Big Boss's body by the Patriots after the destruction of Zanzibar Island's Outer Heaven. These bodies were then left in the hands of Dr. Clark, the chief medicine of Foxhound and one of the founding members of the Patriots. And through Clark's research, Gray Fox's life was restored via the beauty of technology. His brain and body parts shoved into an exoskeleton and had it grafted to his bones. And from that point on, Gray Fox became Dr. Clark's plaything when it came to genome experiments. She even wired his body wrong on purpose to ensure he could never find true comfort when working with him. Though the suit itself did help keep Fox alive while Clark would experiment with his genes. It also helped overcome the body's natural stress and rejection responses when it came to unfamiliar genetics being injected into the body. And over four years of constant drugging, experimentation, and genetic manipulation, Fox would completely lose track of his own identity through both the pain, and total body genetic rewriting. Though, his body did prove useful for creating the Genome Soldier Project, and later on the nanomachines they used to suppress his emotions, would go on to influence the Sons of the Patriots' own emotional suppression system. Though the rumors of these experiments would spread out and soon find the ear of his sister, Naomi Hunter. And in the year 2000, Naomi would join Foxhound and work under Dr. Clark as her assistant, as Naomi would assume the identity of a Dr. Naomi Hunter who had disappeared two years prior to becoming Dr. Clark assistant. And after winning Clark's trust in 2003, Naomi would actively sabotage an experiment involving Gray Fox, which would lead to the death of Clark and the escape of Gray Fox himself. She did this both to help her brother escape, but also because she was contracted to by Big Mama and Revolver Ocelot in order to get rid of one of the founding members of the Patriots. These two likely were the ones who pulled the string to help Naomi get her identity as well. And after this, Naomi would falsify Gray Fox's death alongside Dr. Clark so Fox could wander free. Though now his mind was damaged beyond repair and Naomi took him into hiding with an ironic twist of fate given how they met. But Fox would later run away after seeing Naomi's face and being reminded of his guilt. He still felt that nagging guilt about her parents' death and didn't want to drag her any deeper into the political mess that was his life. So, yet again, Fox disappeared. And Fox wouldn't resurface until two years later on Shadow Moses Island, during the Shadow Moses incident, and he would appear under the new moniker of Cyborg Ninja, which is given to him by the guards on the base, and using a full body cloaking device, Cyborg Ninja would stalk the halls of the base, cutting down anyone in his way, all to try to find his old apprentice and dear friend, Solid Snake, in hopes of fighting him one more time. He also acts sort of as a guide and guardian angel for Snake as well, both by taking on the name Deep Throat, which is a direct reference to the the FBI agent who exposed Richard Nixon's Watergate scandal, and of course saving him from a surprise attack from Revolver Ocelot by cutting off his arm and unknowingly setting up one of the most important and critical moments in the series. My hand! 
Also, funny enough, when using the moniker of Deep Throat, Gray Fox would provide very useful tips to the player, just like on Zanzibar Islands Uprising, which is in direct contrast to the other returning Codex support team member, Master Miller, who gives basically useless advice to Snake that is nearly impossible for him to pull off in the game. Snake, that floor is designed so that your footsteps echo. Listen, Snake, there's a way to walk so your footsteps won't be heard. I call it stalking. Here's how you do it. First, put your weight on the opposite foot that you're going to step with. Then, take a step so that your heel makes contact with the ground first. Then, as you slowly lower the tip of your foot to the floor, gradually shift your weight onto that foot. Use your knees to maintain the subtle balance. Try it. I... I can't do it. Another way is to wear your socks over your shoes. Which is almost a wink and a nod to the people who had played the previous two games before Solid. In fact, the entire character of Cyborg Ninja is almost a rehash of the entire character of Gray Fox from Metal Gear 2. But then again, that's the entirety of Metal Gear Solid 1. It's just Metal Gear 2, but they don't have Big Boss as the antagonist. Though Snake only truly encounters Cyborg Ninja for the first time when he goes to Hal Emmerich's lab, in which the two battle it out, and Cyborg Ninja comments that he remembers Snake's punch, and that he's been waiting for this feeling again. Snake is able to piece together that Cyborg Ninja is Gray Fox pretty quickly, and then after a freakout from Cyborg Ninja, he flees and isn't seen until the end of the game. Though I say end of the game, he actually has two optional appearances before this. One as Deep Throat and one as Cyborg Ninja. The first of them being, if the player is struggling to escape Johnny McShitta's pants, then Cyborg Ninja will appear and break the door, allowing them to instantly escape. And then, if the player doesn't check their inventory for the bomb left behind by Ocelot, then they'll get a codec call from Deep Throat before it's about to go off so that they can get rid of it just in time. But when Cyborg Ninja, or now Fox, truly returns again is during the final boss fight with Metal Gear Rex. Fox shows up and saves Snake once again, using a laser arm to disable Rex's radar and forcing Liquid to open the mouth hatch. Though, the conflict causes him to lose one of his arms and his body completely crippled by Rex pinning him against the wall. He then begs Snake to shoot him with a missile that would kill Liquid and him as well. Though, Snake can't do it. Not able to bring himself to kill one of the only friends he's ever had, Liquid then drags the body onto the floor and stomps it with Rex, but not before Gray Fox makes one of the most important speeches in the entire series, telling Solid Snake not to fight for a government, but fight for what he believes in, no matter the consequences. Which is the founding philosophy of philanthropy, an organization that would go on to cripple the Patriots and finally bring global war to an end fully. Gray Fox, in a way, through his life of endless suffering, ended war for at least a day. And funny enough, his role as Cyborg Ninja, one of the most important characters in the series, almost didn't happen. Because you see, Kojima's original plan for Metal Gear Solid had no Gray Fox in it until Yoji Shinikawa showed him a design he had in mind for Cyborg Ninja. Kojima fell in love with it and instantly implemented the character fully into the lore of the series. Along with this, Cyborg Ninja was given a few references to the anime Akira, with both his line, The Medicine, and later his laser arm being a direct reference to the movie itself, reinforcing Atakan's own statement that they were like people straight out of his Japanese Japanimations directly from Japan. But it's just funny to think that Gray Fox's role in Metal Gear Solid 1 became so important that a cyborg ninja archetype would become a staple for the series post-1, excluding 3 obviously given the events happened before the events of 1. Along with this, you can see a lot of Gray Fox's character was recycled into that of Raiden. Both were child soldiers, had their memories altered a multitude of times, had their relationships ruined by the government, picked up wielding a sword, and finally became a cyborg. Though the core difference is between them is instead of trying to escape his demons, Raiden accepted them and became stronger for it, where Gray Fox actively tried to become stronger so he'd never have to face his. Which is why Raiden survives unlike every other cyborg ninja character in the series. Gray Fox is single-handedly one of the most important characters in the entirety of Metal Gear Solid, directly influencing the event and lives of every major character in the series. Everything he did in Metal Gear Solid 1 led to some overall grandiose historical event, all the while living one of the most painful and depressing lives possible. He truly is a case of a character who gains a lot from extra details given to him in future titles and shows that Kojima can truly write some really depressing shit sometimes. And even though it will likely never happen, I still hope one day we get that Metal Gear Rising idea Kojima had in mind, which starred the titular Fox himself, but until then, I'm satisfied with his end.
And if you enjoyed this video and want to see more videos like in the future, I have a Patreon at patreon.com slash guy. And if you want to feel it, feel alive again, then you can buy a copy of Shimonada at buyshimonada.com.